Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today we are joined by Jeff Stifler, Director of Product Marketing Healthcare at Cognosis. And Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor Cognosis. Cognosis utilizes the power of AI to transform tracking data into operational intelligence, redefining the value of location solutions. They help hospitals reduce costs, optimize clean room operations, and improve staff safety with their RTLS and staff duress solutions. Cognosis is able to quickly deploy a system with room level accuracy without room level equipment that excels in complex environments, producing value from day one. So for more information, please visit cognosis.com. Now, just a quick reminder about our full MD Expo. We're headed to the Mohican Sun Casino and Resort in Connecticut from October the 8th to the 10th. So please join us for three days of education, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology products and services. So for more information and registration details, please visit mdexposhow.com. And also another show of ours, uh, please mark your calendars for our HTM Mixer which is being held at the Marriott Resort Griffin Gate, Lexington in K Kentucky. And that's November the 15th and 16th. Our mixers are a slightly modified, smaller, shorter duration and less crowded event, but it still provides valuable education, continuing education, networking and vendor engagement opportunities. So again, for more information and registration details, please visit htmmixer.com. And just another quick reminder that this Friday, August the 16th, is the deadline for submitting a nomination for the 2025 Tech Choice Awards. So please go online at onetechnation.com forward slash Tech Choice Awards and click on the trophy icon. Now today's webinar, as usual, is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI, and you can attain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once you submitted the survey. Now, if you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our webinar Wednesday 10th anniversary prizes. Now today's prize is a $100 Amazon gift card. So using the questions feature on your dashboard, let me know the answer to the following trivia question. Now the 2024 Olympic Games has now come to an end. So where is the 2028 Summer Olympics going to be held? I'll reveal the answer and our winner at the end of the webinar. We'll be wrapping up today's presentation with a live Q&A, so please submit your questions anytime using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Jeff Stifler, and he will be discussing research to implementation, understanding key components of a successful RTLS platform. So Jeff, you may begin whenever you're ready. Perfect, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, hope everyone's having a good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're located. Um, and as discussed, I'll be kind of going through research implementation, kind of trying to map out the journey that if I was in your shoes, you know, that you're going to experience. Um, I understand that RTLS platforms are, you know, it's a complex space and can be complex technology. So really trying to boil down some of the key components um, from your standpoint of, you know, the learnings I've had over the years, you know, for maybe a quick context on myself. You know, I've spent the last 20 plus years in healthcare. The vast majority of it was in health or in hospitals, focused on hospitals um, with med devices, as well as healthcare IT, as well as life sciences. So kind of a, a full spectrum. And the majority of my time has been spent on the commercial side, um, as well as product strategy. So um, defining a product strategy, executing a product strategy, and then ultimately um, how that ties into the commercialization efforts. Um, so with that said, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, this acronyms of RTLS, for those who are not super familiar with RTLS, they are real-time locating systems. Um, and, you know, the platforms that we have or discussed, you know, those have been around about 20 plus years. Um, so as you can imagine, there's been a fair amount of evolution um, in the category ever since. And I am, I apologize here, my slides are not advancing. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. So again, going taking a step back, um, 
putting myself in your shoes. So when we think about RTLS asset management systems, you know, what problems are we trying to solve? So when you go to make a product on like a medical device or healthcare IT, like, you know, what are the, the fundamental question and product strategy is, what is the problem I am trying to solve? In this instance, you know, obviously I'm telling you things you already know, right? But you know, you're trying to reduce time finding machines. You know, the stats say that nurses spend somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of their day looking for stuff. Um, biomed centers are even higher. Um, so reducing time spent so they need to use it, um, time spent trying to find a machine to do preventative maintenance. Um, unfortunately, you know, time spent trying to find a device that potentially has been recalled. So all very important tasks all time spent that I would classify as call it non-value added time, right? You know, those are time that you're not really utilizing your abilities to the best of their worth, um, but it is just time that we have to do. So that, you know, that's typically one. You know, address budget questions. That's typically the question that comes out of, like, why are we buying more IV pumps? Why are we buying more scanners? Why are we renting stuff? Um, how is this rental expense that big? Um, so the budget questions that become addressed when you, know, when you can't find stuff, right? Um, as well as when you know when you know things are hidden or things are misplaced or lost or shrinkage, all of the above, right? So those budget questions. And then lastly, when the first two happen, there's typically um, discontent, right? So why can't you know when you're getting feedback from administrative or nursing on as to why can't I find the machines or biomed, like hey, I, I'm trying to do PM but I can't find the machines. Um, so resolving all of these three things, which are a major problem across almost every hospital I've been at. Um, but fundamentally, if you try to break down what is the actual problem that you're actually having is, um, it definitely goes along the lines of like, you know, you are trying to find the right equipment at the right time. Um, so it's really about equipment distribution, more about finding the equipment. So if the equipment is clean and where it's supposed to be, that really fundamentally solves all of your problems. So with that said, you know, going, taking it back to RTLS and the journey that people have, like everyone kind of fits in, I'll call it three buckets. Um, the first bucket is, I've never tried it. Um, penetration on asset management is still called below 50% across the country. Um, so a good chunk of people have never tried or implemented an RTLS system. And there's various reasons for that. Um, it can be, you know, that they looked into it and realized, this looks difficult, we have other priorities, um, or we can't handle that because we have um, an EMR upgrade or we have another initiative that's kind of take priority. So we, we really like to do it, um, we just, we don't have capacity. Um, the second part is, is I really wanted to do job X, um, but your job does job Y, your product does job Y. So it's kind of the, it's a mismatch of technology. It doesn't quite perform the way you want it to. If the first two are true and you find the perfect solution, you have the capability to do it and the capacity to do it, um, then you get the price tag, right? And it's too expensive. You realize that you know these aren't necessarily cheap solutions, um, and you know everyone has budgets, right? Um, so you know, the solution is what you want, but it's outside of your budgetary um, means. Um, so you can't have it because it's simply too expensive. And then lastly, which is kind of driving all three, is it's the lack of recognition or ROI. So, you, you know, you want to invest X to get back Y, which is hopefully much greater than X. Um, and, you know, based on the math that you're doing, you simply can't get there for a variety of reasons. You know, that's kind of camp one. Camp two, unfortunately, is I have done it previously and I had a bad experience. Um, I, I was burned by it. And unfortunately, th this happens. You know, and, and some of the reasons of why that happened is that the technology simply didn't live up to our expectations. Um, so for whatever reason, right? Maybe it, you know, maybe it was promises were made and not kept. Maybe that wasn't implemented correctly. Maybe it wasn't used correctly. Here nor there, simply the technology didn't deliver what you were expecting. And part two of that is, is the users didn't adopt. It would be a multitude of reasons, um, but fundamentally, you know, the change management and the training, you know, maybe didn't go as smoothly. So your user base, the people who are you're relying on to have the ROI, simply never adopted, and therefore. Um, you have a tool that no one really uses, which typically leads to number three is, you know, if no one's using it or they don't find it to be accurate or the technology is not delivering, you typically lack any value in that system, which then ultimately leads to number four, you abandon the system. Um, you know, even if the first three are not true, you still could have system abandonment because, for example, you lose a champion, you remodel and don't replace. Um, there can be a, multiple reasons on why it's abandoned, um, but these are typically kind of one of the most prevalent reasons of 
why I see where people come in that they have a system and then it gets abandoned or shut down or simply um, it simply flails until it, it, it truly has no, no value anymore. And then lastly, there's the last category. It's the people who are learning, right? So people who are on this webinar to learn about it. So the, the research the implementation. So the people who recognize um, that, you know, as everyone on this phone call knows, is you're being asked to do more with less. Um, a lot of efficiencies are gained in hospitals now through technology, whether that be RTLS or AI or multiple other technical solutions, but there's a need to create more efficiencies with what we have, and a great way to do that is with technology such as RTLS. So you've you said, hey, I, I really want this system. I recognize I have a problem. I recognize I can't find machines. I recognize I don't want to overspend on assets. Um, I want to solve that issue, um, so I'm going to investigate systems like RTLS to help improve efficiency and I know how that I know how that will fit in to my overall digital transformation roadmap my efficiency transformation and I can and I budget it for it right so I have money I, I want to do it um, I've gotten buy-in that um, that we can actually have budget and spend to enable us and that's where you're at today so regardless of what bucket you are in I think this is still a, a very applicable um, presentation for you and I think we'll go through the next slide so Assuming you've never had it, or you're just in the initial research phase, or you haven't looked at this in a long time because you don't buy RTL systems all that often, um, you know, you're going to get bombarded with the different technologies that people utilize in order to provide RTLS. Um, so you'll see there is a whole range of ultrasound and Wi-Fi and ultra wideband and RFID and infrared and Bluetooth and, and now AI, um, all of which kind of have different pros and cons. So I'm not gonna go super deep into the very technical reasons of why ultra wide band may be better or worse than Bluetooth or infrared. They certainly all have their positives and negatives. Uh, I will tell you that the most predominant ones that I see today are Bluetooth, infrared, um, as well as ultrasound. And then a legacy Wi-Fi, but you don't really see that all too often, all that anymore. But those are kind of the, the predominant ones with AI obviously being the newest comer and the fastest comer to the marketplace. Um, so, you know, the point being in this is that, you know, it's overwhelming if you're just starting out of trying to understand RTLS and the solution, you're going to get hit by all these technology platforms, all of which have limitations, all of which has pros and cons. Um, so my intent here is to kind of walk you through, like, here's some things to think about as you try to address this to make your life simpler. So with that said, um, when I talk about trade-offs for all these technologies, you know, these are typically your trade-offs, right? So for example, we talk about performance that's typically defined in accuracy and latency, or you know, we talk about accuracy is it, you know, your, your terms of like unit level accuracy, near room level accuracy, room level accurate, or even chair level or sub room level accuracy. And then latency is just the, a fancy word for how fast does it respond? Um, so in our instance, you know, those are kind of a dichotomy of two, right? So the, generally speaking, the better accuracy or the more accurate you want, the more expensive it is. Uh, that is kind of the traditional incumbent way of like how it actually works out. And then, you know, the more accurate and the more typically equates to the more hardware or sensors you are required, that directly goes to how hard it is or how big the implementation is, as well as how large is the maintenance post implementation. Um, so they all, like it's a it's a constant trade off, right? It's a constant compromise of, I want really, 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 really accurate performance that's going to come at a high price tag typically, um, that will call, come at a higher implementation cost and a higher maintenance. On the flip side of that is, is if you have lower accuracy, there is definitely a point of diminishing value where without at least a minimum level of accuracy, it doesn't have a lot of usefulness um, to anyone. Um, so those are the trade-offs. So when you think about buying a system, you know, the step one is, is what does it have to do for my application? What does it need to do for me? And I can kind of talk you through the intent of the presentation is what I've seen as being useful. Like what is kind of like the base level and then what, what is like the best case scenario for most applications of asset management. So when we talk about accuracy, you know, and I'll use, I'll pick on Wi-Fi maybe a little bit. Is you know, we'll call it 30 foot accurate, right? Um, Wi-Fi, just like Bluetooth, goes through walls and floors. So one of the downfalls of some technology is they go through floors without proper, without proper gating. So 30 feet of accuracy is important. And why should you care? Because that 30 feet could mean um, 
north, south, east, west, as well as up and down. So you may see an asset that shows on the second floor, but that actually could be the third floor or the first floor, depending on the technology you pick. Um, in this instance, you know, when you have this, this problem is called floor jumping. Um, this would be, I would argue, is it's not very useful, right? It is better than nothing, um, but searching between floors, three, three floors being your option, you know, isn't providing the value that you most likely pay for. So it's, so the, the important part is when you think about what is my requirement for accuracy, you should really think through what are the limitations of the technology? Is it 30 feet in any direction? Is it 10 feet in any direction? You know, is it at the unit level? But really kind of narrowing down what exactly do I need it to do and how precise do I need it to be? And I'll take it one step further, right? So if you basically want, you said, if you heard this and say, well, this doesn't work for me, right? But upper and floor, you know, floor up, floor down doesn't work for me. I want it to be at least near room, if not room level accurate. So that's your, that's not your minimum standard. So if you've eliminated technologies that don't deliver that, then you kind of go into, in the ideal scenario, we talk about equipment distribution, you know, all RTLS systems will help you find an equipment. The question is, is do you want nurses still spending their time searching for equipment, or would you prefer to basically have a good equipment distribution process that utilizes like a clean room and soil room, right? Where instead of the nurses going to the app, the application and trying to find an asset, you know, they can just go to a clean room. So if you're going to this level, and I would say this is probably the ideal state best practice, is that you utilize a clean and, clean and soiled room, for like a centralized distribution model, then the matter becomes a matter of like what type, what level of technology do you have? Because even near room may not be sufficient in the fact that if that's your asset, um, it's going to be really really hard for you to do what's called par leveling um, if your soil and clean are relatively close to each other because the equipment may show up in the wrong spot. Um, so this is that level again, a level of value that you would think through of how accurate does it need to be does it have to be room level accurate um, maybe for helpful context i've never found a need yet um, that had to be sub room level accurate for asset management so maybe something to consider so typically it's just a function of do you need room level accurate or do you need near room level accurate and then lastly if you want room level accurate with most of the vendors today this is what your infrastructure will look like so the green dots are potentially you know representative sensors that you would have to install from a hardware perspective so if you want room level accurate you will need a sensor of some sort in most rooms um, so if you think about this this is important because you know this implement this basically interjects another level of maintenance so not only do you have to pay for all this hardware up front you have to also then pay for all this hardware to be installed up front you also need to now pay to have someone maintain this hardware. Um, so in some instances where if it's a wired solution, you will need to have a, you know, the wiring set, a one-time cost up front. The alternative is you can also use battery operated, which depending on the life of the system, you also need to pay someone or undertake basically having the maintenance of replacing batteries and all this equipment. So again, going back to what are your requirements, like this is one of those things of, you know, understanding like what you're getting yourself into with certain technologies and or eliminating or proposing certain technologies that you want to move forward with. So if we think about the ultimate, like how does this stuff get approved? So you, you want this system, you, you have buy-in to get the system, but you have to basically show that it is actually a positive ROI, right? So if you, you know, use the general boxes on the left-hand side, you know, those who are super, um, super accurate, right? So at least uh, you know, near room, if not in room technology, is you know, traditionally going to be higher priced than those that are you know low 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 accurate and then consequently the more hardware you have um, the more disruptive it is and the more expensive it is to install and maintain you know you're basically gonna have these boxes where you know hopefully you don't end in the bottom left you most likely are going to end up in the marginal ROI with ideally you want to be in the top right um, but generally speaking most RTL providers are in that middle band or in between the, the dashed lines um, and that's because of the reliance on hardware uh, it's just the it's unfortunately just that's that's the limitation of what everything is it's not good not bad but that is kind of just how the math plays out 
so if you think about value the value chain of what we talked about and this is kind of like driving to the slide is you know what is the value and how do you get high value out of it so if you look at from the the bottom to the top on the blue boxes on the left physical location you can think of that as literally um latin long so latitude longitude what is, where is the actual device at and then logical location is referring to we have then assigned that lat long to mean that it is on the third floor on the north wing in room four um, the inference then is basically how you interpret that data um, so if you think about if you just want to locate stuff you don't want to do par level you just want to do the bare minimum threshold like that's typically where you you start um, that would also require basic i'll call it near room accuracy if, however, you want to continue on and go through the guidance and trends and you, you know, really do very fine level par leveling, you actually need to be slightly more accurate. Like we discussed earlier, you need to have slightly more accuracy so you can start making strategic decisions on you know, what does the budget look like to spend machines because you know your utilization rate. So you're able to track your utilization, you're able to track throughput, you're able to understand exactly how much your rental expense is and how much it has been reduced by the use of accurate equipment distribution. Um, so you really actually, when we talk about value, if you can get a certain level of accuracy out of your RTLS system, you actually can drive much, much more value um, in that process, um, and as well as learning your process a little bit better. Um, so you can understand where the machines go, where do they stop, where is the bottleneck? Um, so it actually helps inform. There's a kind of a an old adage, like you can't, you can't improve what you don't measure, you can't measure what you don't see. Um, so this is kind of like that step one is seeing it will get you one aspect of it, but if what you're seeing isn't super accurate, the actionable data is, is there limited. So the more accurate you get to a certain point, um, the better you'll be able to make strategic decisions, um, as well as drive that ROI, which fundamentally is, you know, from a administrative level, what you're trying to do is you're buying a system in order to help improve efficiency and drive the value out of that, which is the ultimate goal, as well as making everyone's life much, much easier. So with that, you know, if you had to take a very, very broad stroke of, you know, what does the last 20 years of RTLS look like? You basically have, you can kind of boil down into two levels of solutions, high cost or higher cost, very high accuracy, great systems. Um, but, you know, those are, you know, exactly what we talked about, you know, they're heavy on hardware um, and they have pretty big initial upfront costs or total costs, right? So the thick technologies that fit in there are infrared and ultrasound. Um, and then if you go into the emerging technologies that are basically starting to go is ultra wideband, um, as well as uh, AOA is angle of arrival Bluetooth. So it's basically a refined Bluetooth that is slightly more accurate than just Bluetooth um, low energy or BLE. On the right hand side, you know, this is kind of the advent is legacy technology. It's the Wi-Fi we talked about, Zigbee and RFID. Then you have these uh, a fair amount of new emergency that uh, new emergent technologies that use Bluetooth low energy. Um, the nice part about you know Bluetooth or BLE is it enables to basically use a commodity technology like Bluetooth and adapt it to get pretty good results um, by using I'll call it low cost hardware. So even though you may need a lot of it, um, you do actually kind of lower the hardware costs up front versus you know older systems where you know it would be more expensive. Um, and these can typically plug into outlets or be battery operated and have relatively low power consumption. Um, but the problem with both of those is, right, even with low cost, if you kind of see this, this basically representation is, you know, you're going to get accuracy. That's not that's not bad. Um, but if you're talking about doing par leveling, you really want it to look like this, right? You really want to do, and this is one of those compromises, right? And this is one of the things that you see as you compromise on, I really want this, my budget is X and the bill is Y um, and Y is bigger than X. So, you know, how can I basically fit the system? Cause I want this, but how do I fix it into my budget, right? So then you see things like, you are know, only gonna do half the facility or, you know, we're gonna eliminate this other building or there's all kinds of things that people compromise but in order to make it work for them for their solution. Cause they fundamentally do see the value even if in a limited capacity. Um, but these are kind of like the in, in broad, very broad buckets. You know, the last 20 years is kind of what it's gone down to, um, and, and what that looks like overall. So that again, this is you know not super scientific, um, but this is like a general Harvey ball of you know what does that look like. So for example, 
infrared can get you in room, actually sub room accuracy, um, but it is can be challenging to install and disruptive to install. And you know, there's a consistent maintenance aspect to it. Bluetooth near room, generally speaking, it's near room accurate. Um, it's less disruptive to install, um, but you always have to worry about those sensors. Um, Wi-Fi, just in general, right, not super accurate, um, not really disruptive, um, and there's not really maintenance, but then you question, like, going back to accuracy levels, if it's 30 plus feet accurate, like, does it really actually have that much value if it isn't that accurate? Um, and then I won't go through all of these, but you'll see, like, these trends of ultrasound, ultra-wideband, super accurate, uh, pretty disruptive, and the maintenance cost, right? So fundamentally, all comes the the cost, and cost maybe is just one component. So, but the higher the cost, the harder the IOI is pretty much how it boils down to. And then lastly, not to belabor, but artificial intelligence is kind of like this this new frontier, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in the presentation. But that's that one of those like it's proving not to be. It can be in room accurate. Um, it can be minimal disruption, and in most instances, it's you know, pretty much maintenance free or very minimal maintenance because you're using very little hardware. That is the advantages of using artificial intelligence as a, a core part of the technology or the location engine is that you're basically, you're, you're substituting software algorithms and artificial intelligence to what a hardware used to do. Um, so that enables you to have a very light hardware infrastructure um, so you minimize that hardware expense, you minimize the maintenance and upkeep, and you basically build a, you know, a, a robust model of implementation that allows you to have in-room level accuracy um, without all of the burden of the hardware and all the burden of the maintenance that goes with it. So with that said, you know, let's, we've been talking about mainly about technology and platform. But I would tell you from my experience is that like that's one piece of the big pie. Um, so in a traditional research and implementation process, you have the pre-implementation planning, you have the actual implementation, meaning like the physical placement of sensors and hardware and the mapping of the facility. Um, some of this is done on site at the hospital. Some of it is on the back end of the providers, but you have this implementation process and then you have go live. Um, and I would tell you that you know, traditionally, like that's kind of where most people stop, right? They get these first three, and then you know, from the provider side, is they're kind of done, right? And, and maybe they have support. Almost everyone has support to some degree. But what does support mean, right? Does that mean when it breaks, you call and I'll answer a question, or does that mean like someone's actively there helping you? You have a, a wide spectrum of you know basic customer support to some people do have customer success teams that will kind of help. I would tell you that you know, in your evaluation of RTLS vendors, one of the things that I would be looking for is really going honing on the provider that focuses on the continuous improvement and the value delivery. So going back to again that slide of like what has typically failed is you know they don't see an ROI. Um, some of that is both connotative as well as literal. So you know if if you have an RTLS system and people aren't spending as much time searching for equipment, there is value there. Um, but that's not necessarily a value that someone's always speaking about or realizing. It just becomes the norm. Um, so when we think about continuous improvement, that is also a function of does the provider give you, I'll call it a dedicated resource or resources that help you not only continue to understand what the system is doing, but then also help you make improvements in your process so you can realize how to make improvements in your facility. So put another way, is someone on the customer success team actively looking at your data, making recommendations on how you can improve stuff? So as you evaluate potential providers, you know, that would be one thing that you may want to ask about is, is hey, how, how do you help me after the fact? You know, there's lots of data, there's very little information. You know, who's gonna help me realize the most amount of value or maybe point out best practices and how we can change or look for bottlenecks um, to actually improve, which then translates that to that continuous delivery of value. Um, so not only getting better at how the process is, but then also you can realize, you know, you projected a reduction in rental expense, you projected a reduction of overbuy of equipment. Like, are you realizing that value? Um, and do you have stuff that you can report up to prove that, you know, this was a sound investment idea on your part? Um, so when you look through so when you look through these people that 
you know, potential providers you have, like that, those are some of the things that you should keep in mind. Uh, if you're only searching for someone that stops here and maybe gives you customer support when some of the hardware goes down or you can't log into it, like, you know, there, there's probably better options out there for you. So really think through, like, what are you looking for and what does that vendor provide beyond the go live date? Um, so it's really, really important um, as you go through, especially in SaaS-based models, that's kind of how they're set up to be, is continuous improvement. So what is your path to ROI? So as, as I think here, and I'm actually, uh, sorry, you can see in the background, I'm at a hotel because I'm at a hospital go live. You know, what, what is your path to ROI and asset management? You know, step one is find, find all the machines. Uh, the, the books say you have 800 of them, but you only find 600 of them. So step one, find the machines. Um, and then when typically when you can't find all the machines, you know, you really need leadership buy-in to help you know, facilitate the process. Um, you know, I've never been in a facility where someone didn't hide machines somewhere, right? Just in case of emergency. Um, so you really need leadership buy-in to help facilitate getting this process up and running um, so it runs efficiently. And that typically then comes down to getting the nursing buy-in. So finding the machines, you get leadership. After, when you can't find the machines, you get leadership buy-in to say, hey, this is the process that we have to you know, help with change management on. You know, let's go get nursing buy-in so they, they can understand that, yes, they're, they're giving a machine up so they can have more later, um, which typically then leads to finding more machines. Um, if you can't tell, that's a common theme is finding the machines because you never quite find all of them. Uh, but finding the machines is, is definitely the step one and path to ROI. But then after you found all the machines, now you start analyzing the process. So you put the process in place you are seeing like how is it actually working in the system and part of that is the change management learning curve part is it is the adoption aspect from uh, the people who are using the equipment um, but then also it is also finding the bottlenecks right so like you thought it went one way the data tells you it's actually moving slightly different or you thought the bottleneck was here it's actually over here you can shift your resources to fix the problems Again, what you can't see, you can't measure or fix. So this enables you to start fixing the problems that you otherwise would have never have had visibility into, which then ultimately comes to apply the learning, right? So I, I can see the data flow. I can see how it's going through. I am now going to take my learnings and hopefully the provider tells you this, or if you, if you have to do it yourself, you can now go fix the process yourself and you can actually start fixing what you're measuring, um, which is fundamentally how you realize the value. So in my experience, you know, where do we see um, some of the pitfalls? So, you know, it's not a short list. I don't want to, didn't put a lot of stuff up here to scare anyone, um, but there's a lot of variables at play in this and it can go wrong in a variety of ways, right? Um, COVID could happen, for example. Um, you can have a, a, and the EMR goes down, right? So all, all priorities shift to that, but, what I've seen in my experience and you know where where systems fail or maybe you know they're successful but not as successful as they could be is it started the implementation right it, it wasn't wasn't rolled out all that well because people weren't trained right so you didn't have the buy-in from people because they simply didn't know how to use a system and they're busy so they're not going to go out of their way to learn a system that they're frankly not 100% sure what it does um, so you have an incomplete implementation, you may have incomplete training, and all this leads to incomplete change management, right? So you have people that don't want to change, they don't see the value in it, so therefore they're simply not going to. Um, so going back to, again, like finding equipment versus a complete equipment distribution model, that system may have value by just simply being able to find the machine, that is, that is better than nothing. Um, but without change management training and a good implementation, you'll never be able to realize the full value of basically having the nurses never have to look for equipment because it's always in the right spot. Um, so talk about change management and then typically change management comes hand in hand with leadership, right? So if you don't have leadership spine and leadership support, helping facilitate the process and implementation, that tends to be an area of concern. And then the champion, um, someone at the site has to have accountability that's pushing for it. Um, we have seen, I've seen personally where the system works fantastic and then that champion that really was the pioneer of the system, you know, gets promoted or leaves the facility or changes roles um, and then it, it kind of languishes a little bit, right? So the system's still operating perfectly fine, but there's kind of no one overseeing or guarding it to, to make sure that it's still working correctly. So it kind of then languishes a little bit. 
Number six is that continuous ROI demonstration. Again, people have short memories, right? So even though you may derive value from it, unless that's being realized and communicated upward, um, those who are making financial decisions that may not be in the in the weeds every day, you know, that come may come into question, right? Is how much value does this provide, especially in a SaaS-based model, for example, where they're signing a check every every year, every month. Um, so providing that continuous ROI demonstration and then dedicated ownership, just like a, a champion, right? Having someone who owns it, who understands it, who looks after it. Um, and number eight, this one's kind of unique. Um, for those that, for example, um, have lots of hardware, you have invariably infrastructure deterioration, not because the hardware stops working, but rather because your hospital changes. So, you know, remodeling is super common in hospitals where they, you know, they change where the kiosk is. So COVID is a great example. A lot of people change their configuration to help accommodate COVID, right? So you move a wall here, you move a wall there. Someone's working on the sprinkler system. They cut some wires. Um, no one really knows what it is. They plan to remodel, but didn't plan the remodel um, and to upgrade to your RTLS system. So now, you know, a chunk of your RTLS system doesn't work because they didn't plan for it and there's no budget. So it kind of deteriorates, right? So it isn't a... That is not a set in stone um, example, but it is exceptionally common just because you know, hospitals are very fluid, um, both from a personnel standpoint as well as the actual infrastructure. Um, you know, there's always something that's being worked on, so to speak. Um, number nine, being a stagnant provider, that's that you should expect that whoever's providing your RTLS system is continuing to invest and advance their system. So, so for example, uh, if you have, I'll call it five reports today, I, I think it's very reasonable that you should expect them to have six or seven reports next year. Or, you know, if you have a, a problem area that is a technical problem, that you know, it's fully reasonable to expect that they're improving their hardware and improving their software to make a, a better product for you. So if you have a provider that's not continuing to invest, then that's also something you should be watching out for that, which all of this all leads to number 10, right? Which is poor utilization. So the system's in, a handful of people have, think it's great, it provides value, um, but overall it's simply just not used all that well. To maybe no fault of the technology, um, it's simply just not adopted all that well. And so fundamentally it languages and back to why they fail, it is abandoned. Um, so these are all kind of common pitfalls that, that I have seen over my career. And at the end of the day, right, so you, you've picked your platform, you've, you've designated your requirements, you've moved forward with the technology and provider that you think is going to support you and get you your expected results. Like, what are the expected results? Well, those expected results are fundamentally the, going back to the jobs to be done. You should have the right amount of equipment, clean equipment in the right place at the right time. Um, that should be the model. Um, so, you know, ideal state, you know, that is basically you don't have to look for anything because everything's in the spot where it should be and the process is flowing. And what does that translate back to at a very tactical level? It is you're not spending as much time looking for stuff. So nurses aren't spending 10 to 20 percent of their day looking for equipment. Biomed is not searching facilities on end looking for the preventative maintenance. Um, you're not buying IV pumps or telemetry packs or more wheelchairs than you actually need because the stuff's simply not where you can find it. Um, you're reducing your rental expense because you can find all your equipment. So you don't need to rent 50 more, 100 more IV pumps because you know where yours are. You have recall compliance. So again, you can find your machine so you can actually go comply with the recall as well as your preventative maintenance. And then lastly, um, while relatively undertone in this presentation, like you resolve the complaints, right? You resolve the angry person saying, I don't have my machine, my patient needs one, find one for me now. Um, so you resolve kind of the complaints, whether that be from the availability of the machines or why am I spending this much money on overbuys and rentals and all the other fun stuff that, you know, people get yelled at for. Um, so, you know, these should be your expectations and these should be the results that you realize um, when you actually do an asset manager system with RTLS. What are the future trends? And this is one of the last slides, you know, I'll kind of go through these is, you know, what you're seeing in the RTL space is you're seeing more and more SaaS based models. So software of a service. So instead of having initial large upfront install cost, it becomes basically a service model. So you're going to buy software and then, you know, in, in some instances, the, the company, the provider then not only continues to maintain the hardware, but then also the software you're paying basically a month of their annual fee and they basically do all the work. 
um, versus an on-prem system, which on-prem literally means a server and the data sits on a, on a server on a computer at the site. Um, you know, basically a third party is alleviating your IT and everyone from doing that work. Um, so it's, it's one model that you, you see more and more. The second model is cloud-based applications. So again, instead of being an on-prem system, you're putting things into the cloud, right? Which actually enables the third point, which is enterprise intelligence. So right now, if you have an on-prem server at you know one hospital, you'd have to figure out how to get your data from hospital one to hospital two, which has a different server into one spot and then merge the data if you want to see or compare between the two in a cloud-based application in most instances um, they're on in a technical one instance of the, of the server so you just natively can actually see both um, which enables you to manage the enterprise at, at the enterprise level instead of at the facility level um, so if you think about again best practices if you have a, a if you're in a system an idn that has 10 12 15 20 hospitals it really allows you, again, going back to that data is who is doing it really well, what bottlenecks to experience, and if you find a best practice, how do you then replicate that at all the other hospitals, but then how do you have the data to basically be able to see and realize that improvement across all of them? Inter interoperability, that is the function of, you know, this isn't the first software, RTLS is simply one software of many softwares to improve efficiency in one area of the hospital, um, but the more technology we use, the more value it, it actually has when you combine the data together. It is the true one plus one equals three analogy. So um, if you think about a simple thing of part level of, you know, it'd be great if we can establish part level and I know, you know, how many pumps I need about and how many floors based on the average census, but I'll, you know, the what if scenario is, what if I actually tied it into my EMR and I actually knew real time what my census was, right? And could, could my part levels dynamically change if I knew the two together, right? So there's numerous instances where if you start combining all of these data streams together, um, you actually get a much richer, much more valuable solution and platform overall that you can use. So interoperability has tremendous value as we continue to merge. I would kind of very much equate it to, um, not to date myself here, but like in the early 2000s when you had different enterprise softwares for, one was operations, one was for HR, one was for finance, and none of them really talked together. Um, not to say we don't still have some of those, but they all kind of operate together and you can kind of get mismatch of data to give you actually a much richer data set and understanding what's going on. Now, this is no different, right? You're basically combining different technologies um, to help inform the other, which actually ultimately lends to a much, much richer um, data set. Um, barrier to entry, that's just a, a fancy way of saying like, it shouldn't get cheaper. Um, so today you, you don't have 100% adoption. I would speculate it's largely due to cost cost and complexity. So as the complexity of the solutions goes down, as we continue to use um, AI, as we continue to use, I'll call it off the shelf technology like Bluetooth, um, fundamentally the, the economies of scale are already there. So we're seeing the costs actually come down. So as they continue to come down, you know, we're going to reduce the barrier of entry for, uh, for every hospital to be able to invest in the system and realize the value and then prescriptive analytics and that is a fancy way to say, like, as opposed to us just simply telling you where the machine is, it is moving from telling you about what to telling you what to do. Um, and I don't mean that in a um, hierarchical manner. It's more of like, um, hey, your average throughput on this hospital on this day and this floor is X. Um, you, you probably don't need a per like uh, that person spending time there. You can actually redeploy them to a different place. Um, so it's it's moving from in giving people data to actually giving them information and helping informing them on decisions that they should be doing. And lastly, artificial intelligence, I mean, it is obviously an enormous buzzword, right? It, it is everywhere. I think it's safe to assume that the future is not completely known, but I think what is safe to assume at this point is, is that uh, it's hard to imagine that it's not going to continue to expand um, and get deeper. And it does offer us um, infinite uh, nearly infinite potential for efficiency. Um, so if you think about artificial intelligence, you know, as, and I'll go back to like, as, as the core of the RTLS technology, it really enables you to help minimize other things, right? And, you know, we are just at the starting point of artificial intelligence, even though we've come a long way, we were very much at the starting point of artificial intelligence. So it's hard to imagine that in the future, you don't see even more adoption and people going further and further because the value proposition of using artificial intelligence it's, you know, at this point, it's kind of undeniable, right? And the, and the potential is very high. 
and, and I'll use this as just kind of an example of you know how fast it has morphed. So this is mid-journey version. So this is simply an imagery software, imagery AI. So if you look at version one on the far left, um, it was released, this version was released in 2022, and that's what that image looked like. So not terrible, not good, um, but you know, it's it was a work, right? It was a work in progress. So if you then go to version five, 5.1, which was released one year and three months later, it is a monumental difference. So you could think about the speed of which this is improving. Um, it's hard to imagine that like it's going to stop, right? May it slow, may the pace of innovation slow down some potentially, um, but it's undeniable that the speed of AI evolution is exceptionally fast, um, and it is definitely where a lot of companies are turning um, to to realize those uh, efficiencies that we we long for. Um, so, you know, this is just a, a fun example of like, look at where we were in February of 22, look at how far it came, how fast it came one year later. Um, so if you think about like, if you're trying to future proof your, your platform and technology, you know, that's something to consider that's, you know, AI is not going away. It's just really a matter of how you can harness this next gen of technology um, in, in, a, in a reasonable way. So with that said, I know I am at a quarter till, I will open it up for Q&A and I actually will leave uh, my contact information on here um, as we ask questions. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. We've got a few questions coming. Um, the first one is, okay, from what we've seen, RTLS is too expensive. So how is, how is this different? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think, you know, twofold. You're seeing the, you're, you're seeing I'll call it three migrations, right? So if you are in a traditional technology that was considered very accurate for it, but expensive, you're seeing a, a wireless version. That, that's not new news. Um, then you're seeing the deployment of, I'll call it um, ubiquitous, like so Bluetooth, right? So Bluetooth is a cheaper technology. It may not be as accurate, but for, for many use cases, it is adequate. So you're seeing, I'll call it like commoditized technology being widely adopted and spread. So that is lowering the cost again, because the hardware, you still need a lot of hardware. And then again, going back to artificial intelligence, you're taking that set, like that one next step forward. Um, you are seeing people use um, artificial intelligence to replace the hardware. So it enables you to basically reduce that upfront expense and implementation and maintenance, maintenance expense by using, by relying heavier on the software than you are on the hardware. So that's kind of like the evolution that you're seeing is, um, you know, in the, in the perfect world, right? You'd, you'd have no hardware, right? Or it'd be so like minimal that it really wouldn't matter. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the trend that it's on, is the more you can reduce the hardware aspect, um, the more you can drive down the, the barrier of entry at the initial cost, as well as the model, right? So instead of having a budget, budgetary need of like half a million dollars or a million dollars or $150,000, right? You're going into a SaaS model, typically those you know, the hardware expenses then spread. Um, so all of which are moving to, our, to a lowering that overall initial shock to the system and making it more attainable. Right. So another question here is um, the problem we have is getting support. So how can we get support from other teams inside the hospital to, to get this approved? Yeah, no, this is excellent. And this is probably one of the bigger questions I face, especially for asset management is, hey, I want your solution, but I don't necessarily have the budget. Who can I get? Right. So in, in my experience, you have two things is um, someone will need to build the business case. Right. So there are lots of I'll call it ROI calculators out there. Providers should be able to provide you with one where basically it can tell you, like you, you download how many machines you have, you can probably look at your utilization rates. Um, if you go to like something like a par leveling, right? So you can basically show that you'll need a, you'll actually have a equipment reduction, which you know invariably I'll use IV pumps, that's the easy one. Like you're gonna buy some every year. How many less are you going to buy because you can boost your um, utilization by 50%? Um, or alternatively, you know, you're spending, again, I'll make up the number, you're spending a quarter million dollars or more a year on rentals. If you can cut that in half, then you know, have you not just paid for the system. Um, so typically when this comes through, it's, you know, ROI, it's, you know, to get functional buy-in, right? Is, you know, what is the ROI that typically is gonna go to the financial people? Um, and then you also get support from nursing to say, hey, wouldn't you like to not look for machines? Um, you know, like, isn't, wouldn't that be a relief in your day? Because you're spending, you know, the study says, you know, 10%-ish of your time, 10 to 15%, 10 to 20% of your time. That's, you know, that's just non-evaluated time. That's stressful and provides no value to anyone. 
Um, so getting back to patient care, um, that's typically how you would then approach um, nursing is, you know, what's in it for them, right? It's the with them, what's in it for them? And it's the, the lack of having to look for machines and always kind of having a machine that you can locate and or in the right spot, right? Ideally, it's in a clean room ready to be used. Um, so that's typically how we've seen it as financial models to help basically drive the point and then buy-in from nursing leadership um, as well. And then lastly, IT, you know, sometimes IT is the driver, sometimes they are the gatekeeper. Um, the less hardware you have, the better it is. Um, so making justification to IT of how big or how small of a burden it is, is also very helpful to you, right? So if you have a hardware intensive, um, a hardware intensive that requires a lot of their um, assistance, that's gonna be a harder sell. If you have less, it's a little bit easier sell for you, typically. Okay, so how do I prove the financial value after implementation? Oh, okay. So typically how that is done is um, you will benchmark before. Um, so there'll be some level of, you can have some level of benchmarking before you go live or, you know, you probably have a decent understanding of your throughput and utilization, um, even if it's in a manual or even dated. Like, so you would basically do the compare and contrast of what it looked like before and what it looked like after. Um, and then more importantly, you'll have that initial period where what does it look like? I'll call it four months, six months post implementation, but then even nine months to 12 months after you've tweaked, right? So again, step one is to measure, step two is to adjust, right? So um, you're gonna basically realize better data of what's actually happening in that call it three to six month time frame, and then you're gonna make adjustments. Um, and then you're gonna be able to approve, you know, prove out maybe like nine or 12 month period, sometimes sooner. Um, that you know this is definitively what happened, right? Sometimes you can do it very, very quick, um, but typically it takes people a little bit of adjustment that change management um, to help realize that. So when you think about implementation, um, it's really like you know the 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 story of we came from here to here, uh, and what's the delta and the difference? Great, we've got one more question here. It's um, if a patient transfer in our, from our, our hospital to another hospital and some IV pumps must go with the patient, how can we monitor this activity? Is there built in alarms? Uh, so it, that is technology and platform technology dependent, right? So I'll speak for a handful that I know. So some places have exit alarms or, or geofences, some call it geofences where yes, um, so you can have it one of two ways is you can have it basically alarm when it literally exits a, a certain point. So um, in diagnosis, we put exit monitors at doorways, at exit points, right? So um, when anything leaves, it will actually send a notification to a designated person that notifies them a machine has left. It actually comes up on the dashboard. Other providers do it similarly that may be very similar to that or they provide a report. Um, in the instance that you described um, where it's actually two facilities, um, it is very plausible if you have a cloud-based or emerged IR system. So more, probably more applicable is um, if you have a cloud-based system and it is um, up at both systems, you will literally see that pump at the other spot. Um, so you actually can just query because it, as long as it's within your system, you, you actually can still see it at the other hospital. Um, again, that's probably relegated to cloud-based systems, um, and it has to be installed. Uh, but the simple answer is is exit alarms. You know most. RTLS providers um, have some level, I would say most, some have it, um, I speak for Cognosis, ours are at wherever you want us to put them at, but typically if they're at doors, it will send a pop-up when it occurs, it will send a pop-up on the screen on the dashboard immediately and then send a notification to whoever you designate to let you know that a machine has um, left the building. Um, uh, others do it in report form, um, but I, I'll speak for Cognosis. You know, if you have both hospitals wired up, you would simply see that asset over in the hospital. It would recognize it because it's it's all one it's all one data set. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for your time and for a great and informative presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to the industry. So please visit cognosis.com. Um, as promised, the answer to today's trivia question is Los Angeles. So congratulations to our winner, Todd Peterson in Iowa. Todd, enjoy your gift card.
Um, just a quick reminder, you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Now, if you've missed any of our past webinars, included any by Cognosis, please visit webinarwednesday.live to view our whole webinar our archive. We'll be back soon with another webinar and of course another 10th anniversary prize. So visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all once again for joining us and for your time today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.